In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go thy way as thou hast believed. So be it done to you. That's what the centurion heard. A man who wasn't even a Jew. He was ostensibly a pagan, but he believed the Jewish faith and later would, be, of course, be converted to Christianity and be a great preacher and die a martyr. As thou hast believed, you've been around for a long time. As I say, I'm an old fat man and I've seen a lot of things and heard a lot of people. And a lot of people have trouble believing. And the reason that I see, the major reason is because they're not experiencing God, because they're kind of, you know, let's be honest with ourselves, wrapped up in ourselves. The more we think about ourselves, the less we believe. The more we're concerned about ourselves, the less we believe. It's all over the gospel. To not be concerned about tomorrow. To believe that God will provide. And that's, everybody knows that. But how in the world do you have that happen in your life? If you're anxious about things, anxiety is just everywhere. Just about everybody's anxious. There's lots of depression. Lots of people feeling just out of sorts. Not really part of things, out of the sort of not fitting in. That seems to be the modern ailment. And really, there's a very simple solution. And the centurion gives us that solution. And St. Paul uh, basically speaks about that solution also. I think about the centurion when I read the epistle of the Romans that we read today, that's that excerpt today, the first one that we read. Because if you think more of God, more of your own sins, more of repentance, more of loving your enemy, more of loving your neighbor, then you have belief because God is in the heart. And when God is in the heart, there's nothing else. There's no darkness. There's none of that uncertainty about life. There's none of the depression. There's none of anxiety. Now you go through things in life. They're hard. When things are hard, they're hard. Absolutely. And when there's tenuous circumstances financially or whatever, of course we have human emotions of, of fear and feeling overwhelmed and all the rest. Those are not inherently sinful. But when we somewhere in, in our heart don't believe really, we don't really think it's going to turn out, then that is, is a terrible affliction to have. That's like hell before hell. So the centurion believed, even though he was ostensibly a pagan, but he had great respect. And I'll tell you why he believed. He believed because he understood authority. We don't understand authority in our country. I don't think people have ever really understood authority very well. Authority is God in the heart. And if God is in the heart, then how can you do anything else? Not because of being forced, but because of beauty. I've talked to you before about examples of, of where we are forced to do things because of what's in our heart, not because of anything external. When a mother's baby cries at 3 o'clock in the morning, what does she do? <coughs> She takes care of her baby, even if she's exhausted. Maybe she grumbles. Maybe she kicks her husband out of bed and says, says you go get him first. <laughs> Maybe she does those things, because those are just human things. But is she going to leave her baby to cry? No. Why won't she leave her baby to cry? Because she loves her baby. <clears throat> because there's this inner force in her that she's going to take care of the baby. It's like that with everything. There's an inner force in us. It's not, it's not that God is forcing. It's that God shows us his light and all we want is light. Why does the flower grow towards the light? Well, because the light is life. There's nobody forcing the flower to grow. But the flower loves light, so it grows towards light. This is an understanding of authority. The centurion understood that the reason why he should obey is because it was the right thing to do. So he said, I'm a man under authority. 
So he knew that he had people that he had, a man that he had come to obey. The man of, of, of immediately above him and the man of immediately above him, he had to obey. He was in a military structure and he was a man under authority. And he understood this because his heart was good, so he obeyed. He didn't have to be complicated about it. You don't have to be complicated about it. Why do you take care of your baby? Because your baby needs you and you love your baby, period. That's it. You don't need to think any more about it. Why should a child obey his parents? Because he loves his parents. And because it's the right thing to do. Not because it's forced. Because it's the right thing to do. And the other way to live is unthinkable. Unfortunately, people think about it. But it should be unthinkable to live in disobedience to our parents or to live in indifference to others. How can we do this when God is not indifferent to us? The reason we love others is because God loves us. Look it up in 1 John. We love him because he loved us. And so there's this force in us that compels us to live according to the gospel. Not external rules. I hate external rules. I was always in trouble in grade school because I hated external rules. You tell me to do something, you don't explain why I wouldn't do it. Which means I was in the principal's office a lot. I was always in trouble in grade school. Fortunately, it was a different time. Because now if we were in this time, I would either have been suspended or kicked out or they would have forced my parents to give me drugs and turn me into some sort of zombie. It was a different time. And I thank God that I was born at least in that time. Although sometimes I feel like a man out of place. This, this world seems very strange to me. I don't understand how shallow it is. Christianity is not shallow. Christianity is so deep. When I came to Christianity, I, couldn't, I just couldn't believe it, how beautiful it was. I couldn't get enough of it. And, you know, I've learned that, you know, there are people that come to Christianity and they take a little bit. You know, they just take a little bit. I'll just have a little bit here. There's this beautiful table. I'll just, I'll just have, you know, a little bit. I'll have a, a croissant and then I'll go away. Are you serious? You should eat everything. But people aren't like that. And some of you are not like that. I don't understand that. I really don't. But I think that fundamentally, though, a glimpse of understanding is you're not experiencing God in your heart. And that's because there's things that are blocking you. Because you don't like to be told what to do. Well, you should be liking to be told what to do. It's great to be told what to do. It's awesome. And to do what you're told. I don't care if you're a parent. I don't care if you're a child. I don't care if you're an employer or an employee. I don't care if you have a bossy friend. I don't care what it is. If you get told what to do, it's awesome. Now, I'm not saying that you just do everything everybody tells you to do. But we should look for opportunities to be obedient, to be under authority, even if it's somebody that we feel is not worthy of being on our authority. Maybe they're much older than us. Well, we should still be obedient to them, to their needs. So this centurion knew he was under authority, and therefore he knew that he could tell his slaves to do this or that, and they would do it. He didn't need to check up on them. And he knew Christ had authority. So he understood how it worked. So he knew that Christ should not come to his home because being a pagan, the Jew should not cross the threshold of a pagan's house. He would be defiled. So he wouldn't ask Jesus to do that. Jesus said he would, but he said, no, 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 Lord. I'm not worthy. All you need to do is speak the word. My servant will be healed. I know. I know about authority. He knew about authority because he lived according to authority. In his heart. Now let's look at how Paul talks about this. The same exact message. It just said differently. We have to learn about authority. Who you should follow. You're going to follow somebody. I remember there was a song during this short sojourn where Bob Dylan said he was a Christian. It was a very good song. You have to serve somebody. And you got to. You got to serve somebody. Maybe some of you have heard it. It's actually a very good song. You're going to serve either God or the devil. Either your passions and sin and death or God. It's one or the other. It's very binary. And if you understand that, and you understand that if you follow sin, you're, you become enslaved to it, 
But if you follow righteousness, you become free regarding sin. You don't have to do it. And you became a, become a slave to righteousness. I understand this word slave is a tough word for people. It's like, why does God allow slavery? God allows slavery and even more slavery and all that. That's too much thinking. God has gradually brought man to a refined state. The ancient world wasn't refined at all. Jewish slavery was a whole lot better than pagan slavery. They had manumission. After seven years, they had to release their slaves. Pagan slaves, they could do anything they wanted to. They could kill them without recourse. It wasn't possible for Jewish slaves or for Christian slaves. So we look at it in the 20th century. Here we are, 21st century, right? And looking at it with our little goggles, with all the slaveries that we have in our world, <laughs> all the people enslaved to their sins, enslaved to their ideas, enslaved to their selves, and we want to talk about slavery. That's another, another topic. But he had slaves. Don't get caught up in it. Clearly he was kind to his slaves. Clearly his slaves obeyed him and he loved his slaves. And they loved him. That might seem impossible for us to understand in our 21st century because we're so smart. But that's what happened in ancient days with good people who owned slaves. And so he knew that his slaves would obey him because it was the right thing to do. So let's see what Paul says. He says, being made then free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. What an incredible thing to be free from sin. Which one of you feels really free from sin? Which one of you, when you think about somebody that hurts you, doesn't have something that happens in your heart and gets kind of icky, huh? Don't you want to be rid of that? Which one of you gets lazy and you shouldn't be lazy, but you're lazy? Which one of you doesn't cuss or does this or that and wants to stop, but you, you really can't stop? Maybe you can make some inroads, but you still have a problem with this sin. All of us have addictions to various kinds of sin. That's what sin does. Sin addicts us. We become slaves to it. But if we are Christian, we're free regarding sin. In other words, we can do it or not do it. Well, and if we're advanced enough, we don't do it. We're not forced to do it anymore. Some of you have had something that addicted you in your previous life. And now you're not addicted to it. What a feeling that is, isn't it? To be free. To be free, you don't have to do that thing anymore. You're not going to do that thing anymore. You don't want to do that thing anymore. It's not going to happen because you've given it up. And, and you're free and you're alive. And you're no longer full of toxins from that thing that you used to do or used to think or used to be. What a wonderful feeling. Probably all of us have something that we were that we are not anymore. And we feel so happy about it. We're free. We're free, but we're not free regarding righteousness. We don't want to be free regarding righteousness. Just like, let's say, a, in a marriage, a good marriage, but, but you have trouble sometimes. You're not free to leave. You don't want to be free to leave. Your child is acting like a little monster. You're not free to get rid of your child. It does, you're not going to even consider that. Now, you're sometimes going to be really angry at them. Etc., etc. But you're not free to be rid of your child. It's an unthinkable idea. <coughs> That's the idea here. Because you love your child, and you love your husband, you love your wife, and no matter what the troubles are, you're going to work through it. Now, of course, in our age, people don't work through troubles. They just go from one set of troubles to the next. But we're not doing that as Christians. We work through our troubles, and we are servants or slaves of righteousness. That's what we should think of ourselves as. And actually, that's a, a, that's a better way to think about it than, than thinking that righteousness is optional, because it's not optional. But St. Paul said something very beautiful. It really kind of bounced out at me today. It really grabbed me when I read it. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. So it's even deeper than this. Yes, it's a good model to say you're free regarding sin, 
and you're a slave regarding righteousness. Whereas before, you were a slave regarding righteousness, excuse me, sin, and free regarding righteousness. In other words, you could do righteousness, but you were definitely going to be sin. Now, we're going to do righteousness, and that's what we're going to do, and we're free to not do sin. We're free. But that's, the deeper is that when God is in the heart, that's all there is, is God. It's just light. And you don't even want to do unrighteousness. That's what the next life is going to be. The next life will be you don't want to do anything unrighteous. It doesn't occur to you to do it. You don't have to fight against it. It just isn't. It's just not part of your life. It's not part of who you are. What an amazing thing that will be. Can you imagine? You're never going to want to get angry, so you'll never get angry. You're never going to want to be lustful, you'll never lust. You're never going to want to judge anybody, you won't judge. And you'll have the power to always be good. That's Christianity. That's the end result of Christianity and all the repentance we're doing and all the struggling we're doing now. And for now, we could think of it in this kind of uh, imperfect way. After the manner of men. We are free regarding sin. We don't have to do it anymore. You still, still can go do it. Any one of us who wants to sin, we can go sin. But we're not free regarding righteousness. We're slaves to righteousness. You love your wife, you love your husband, you love your child. You're not free to be done with it. Because you've made a commitment. And you want to keep that commitment. Nobody's forcing you to make that commitment. It's your heart that makes that commitment. A priest... He's not free to not take care of his flock. He's a slave. He has to take care of his flock. There are days when it's quite overwhelming for me. Pretty much every day. But I'm not free to say, well, you know, I don't want to do this. I'm a slave. I want to be a slave. I'm a willing slave. That's what we are. And when we are like that, then... God sees our belief. In the midst of all our sin and all the other junk that's in us, He sees that we believe. And He helps us. And then things grow and you get bigger and bigger and better. And, and that's how we have such powerful lives. We just commemorate St. John Maximovich. And some of the stuff he did was just incredible. It's just completely amazing. Which one of us would go down to a slum where people were killed all the time, and then we're trafficking children with two bottles of vodka, to trade two bottles of vodka for a, for a child. That's what he did once. He was that tall. Punched over. Had a speech impediment. And he goes into a slum where people were killed daily with two bottles of vodka. They could have just taken the vodka and killed him. But he, he was just did things. You do things when you're full of God. And God protects you. It's amazing. There's other things. You can do some incredible. There's all kinds of stories about St. John that are just amazing. He'd know somebody needed him before they called him in the hospital, and he'd be at the hospital. They'd be thinking, we need to call St. John. And he'd show up. How in the world does that happen? Well, of course. God gave him the knowledge. That's because he lived in God. He had experience of God because he cared about everybody else and not himself. He slept less than, a, less than an hour a day, and that's sitting down, because he had too much else to do, too many other, to pray, other people to pray for, and people to help, and all the rest. He'd serve liturgy, and then he'd visit hospitals for eight, 10 hours, and then he'd serve vigil, and then he'd serve liturgy, and, or, and after vigil, he'd go to the hospitals, and then he just, he never ended, he never stopped. Because he didn't have the option. He was a slave. Now you and I, we give ourselves, I think, a little more options in that regard. And I do too, you know. I, I limit things sometimes because I'm exhausted. That's because of my sins. If I didn't have sins, I wouldn't be exhausted. I would, I'd be sleeping one day, uh, one hour a day, too. And going to the hospital until four in the morning. And, then keeping vigil and then serving liturgy. I can do that too. But I can't do that because I still have some part of me that is a slave to sin. 
and some part of me that considers myself free regarding righteousness. But I'm not free. You're not free. The more you consider yourself a slave to righteousness, the more free you are. Because then your heart is filled with God. That's the secret of having a good life. That's the secret of not having anxiety and depression and all the rest. I'm not being anti-pharmacological. There's time sometimes for, for, for medicinal therapies. But not as often as they're being given now. And certainly not as a replacement for what the soul really needs. What the soul needs is to consider itself a slave to God, a slave to righteousness, and free regarding sin. I can do that or I can't do that. I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to do that. And I'm free to not do that. But I'm not free to not love my brother. I'm not free to not say my prayers. I'm not free to not fast. I'm not free to not do the Christian exercises. Not because somebody's telling me to do them. Not because they're in a book, but because uh, Father Seraphim has given you a list of things you should do. But because they're life. And who would want to not do things that give them life? To do things that purposely bring you death, well, that's, that's, that's ill. That's a mental illness to bring about your death. We bring about our life by being slaves to Christ. And that is what makes you free. That's the secret. And the centurion knew that. And therefore God saw it. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. Now just to drive the point home again, just to hammer that nail so much into the wood that there's going to be a mark of a hammer on the wood. You ever do that? Hammer too much and then there's a big mark on the wood. We're going to drive that nail all the way through the wood here. And we're going to see what St. Paul says more explicitly. So he says, I speak after the manner of man because of the infirmity of your flesh, just as you yielded your members service to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members to righteousness unto holiness. So that addiction that you had to sin, that addiction that you have with your thumbs, or with watching things, or with cursing, or with being stupid, or whatever it is, that, remember that addiction. Now why don't you transfer that addiction to be, be uh, addicted to being a servant of righteousness? And what fruit did you have in the things whereof you are now ashamed? What good is it to be selfish? What good is it to be perverse? What good is it to lie to people? It just brings death. No good whatsoever. But now being made free from sin, he uses it in a kind of peculiar way now. He's saying you're free from sin, meaning you can sin or not sin. You're not forced to sin anymore. You're not forced to not sin. God will not force you to not sin, but he, won't for, he will cause it that you are no longer forced to sin. So you're free regarding sin. It's kind of a strange construct. You're free regarding sin. Now being made free from sin, you become slaves to God, and you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I submit to you, be more of a slave to God. Don't give yourself the option. Internally, in your heart, don't give yourself the option to be mean to somebody, or to lie to somebody, or to be lazy, or to be indifferent, or to not say your prayers. Don't give yourself that option. You're a slave. Be a good slave and be an obedient slave. And then God will be in your heart. And you'll be happy. That's the key to happiness. Is to consider yourself free regarding sin. I don't have to do it. And a slave regarding righteousness. I must do it because it's in my heart. Nobody else is making it. Just me. It's making me be good. Of course, God is helping you to be good. But you're making yourself be good because it's the right thing to do. God bless you. Help you in all things. I'm